Shannon, would you come and just share with us? We got to meet this week and talk a little bit, and you had written out your story for us, and I've, it was so impactful. It, brought tears to my eyes, and I just knew today it was going to be so powerful. And so I would like you to just take a minute and just share from your heart what God did, kind of where you came from, and then what God has done in your life. Well, I'm a Navy brat, originally from Charleston, South Carolina. I grew up in an alcoholic, abusive home. Um, at the age of two, my parents divorced, and we moved around a lot. And with that, there were nights we didn't know where we were going to sleep, if we were going to eat, um, it did cause a lot of mental, physical, emotional, sexual abuse and neglect in my life. In 1983, we moved here to Amarillo from New York. Uh, my mom got a job, and she met a friend who invited her to church, and we became Sunday, Wednesday Christians. And what I meant is we are only Christians on Sundays and Wednesdays. <laughs> <laughs> Things started getting better when my mom got remarried when I was 12. Um, it was good for a while until my brother moved out. And then shortly after that, I turned 14, and I was kicked out of the house, and I lived on the streets. It was very lonely and scary. When I was 17, I signed the papers to join the Army. The day after graduation, I left, and it couldn't have gotten here quick enough. Um, during that time, we were the first group of people to not only train with the men, but live with the men. And unfortunately, I was raped by a fellow soldier. With fear of what would happen to me or being seen as weak, I kept my mouth quiet, and I trained next to the soldier who assaulted me. From there, I went to AIT. Then the battalion I got stationed at, we got sent to Bosnia. Um, I saw and did things that would later take a big turn on my life. In 98, I got to Korea, and I met my husband. After three months, we got married. Um, in 99, we welcomed two boys at two different times. <laughs> wait, hang on just a second, because when I found this out this week, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> she had a, a baby in January and had another baby in December. They both, they both had their first Christmas the same year. <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> You're awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Don't recommend it, by the way. <laughs> in 2003, we brought our daughter in, and I thought being a mom would fill that void would take that pain that I was dealing with away, but I was wrong. In 2007, my husband and I divorced due to my PTSD and other issues that I was handling. Between 2007 and 2016, I had five suicide attempts. Each time I survived, I felt like a failure. The struggles got harder, the pain got harder, the mental fighting was harder. The last suicide attempt on my life left me in a coma and on machines fighting for my life. When I woke up, I found out my children had seen me like that. I found a card from my daughter that said, I don't want another mommy, I want you. I told, I told myself at that time I would never hurt my children like that again. Two months after being released from the hospital, I got an invitation to Amarillo Fellowship to see my goddaughter get dedicated. The minute I walked in these doors, I felt a peace in my life that I hadn't felt in a very long time. I knew I was home. Yes. Four months after that, I got baptized. I have now been serving in the children's ministry for six years. Thank you. I just started out in the youth ministry as well. Um, uh, so I know why I didn't die. I knew God had, a, I found my purpose. Also, after nine years of divorce, my husband and I are back together and happily married. <laughs> um, some of you know I'm battling cancer and other health issues, but I'm happy. It doesn't have me. Okay? I have it so I can tell it what to do. You know? um, I have found people in the church that stand with me, believe in my healing, say they're going to pray for me, and I feel their hands praying over me yeah. all the time. Yeah. And I have people like Pastor Hannah and Pastor Stephanie who constantly pour into my life. They see things in me I don't see, and they help me become the better me that I am. And I am just simply blessed and thankful to call Emerald Fellowship my home. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you.
I don't know about you, but that testimony the other day when we were going through it, I, I couldn't keep, keep the tears away because I'm telling you, just an invitation to, uh, to watching your goddaughter get, get dedicated really did change the trajectory of your life. I mean, Absolutely. it really did, you know? And it's not about just this church, but I tell you what, it's about the power of God. Yes. It's about community. It's about being connected. And God did all of that through the local body. And I mean, all the things of your past, I mean, you know, all of us have a past, all of us have a story, but for you to be brave enough to get up here and tell this story is really huge. And I want to thank you today for doing that. But I want to tell you guys, this is what we're talking about. When we're talking about the power of changing lives. That the 99, God always goes after the one. He cares about the one. He cared about Shannon so much and got her into the local body, got her into the house. And the life change and the impact that she's having on our kids' ministry is huge. So I want to thank you for that and just bless you. And let's give her a big round of applause. That was awesome. Wow. I think I've known Shannon for about seven years. And, man, I did not know all of those things that had taken place in her life. And, again, you know, this series can feel a little bit weighty and a little bit heavy because I was telling the staff and telling a few people that when we come to church, we always like to hear about what God's done for us. We like to hear that, man, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that he saved us, that he's healed us. And, man, when we hear that, we get excited. But sometimes when we recognize the responsibility that we have because of what Christ has done for us, it, it can feel a little bit weighty. Like, am I doing this to earn my salvation? No, we're not. We're doing this because we have salvation. And we want other people to experience the salvation that we have. And so I, there's, a, there's a line here at the bottom. I'm going to step out of the way so you all can see that. It's the question that we're kind of asking throughout the series. Who's your one? Who, who's the one that God's placed in your life today that you can begin to be the love and hope of Jesus Christ to them? Isn't that awesome? Are you all excited about this series? Amen. Hey, I'm going to invite you to stand up. We're going to make some declarations over our life because we do have to constantly be refocusing our life. Listen, you, you, don't, you don't get saved and then everything in your mind and heart is set forever about following after Jesus. It's constant choices, constant adjustments in your life. And so one of the things that we like to do is we like to start off our service by making some declarations. But something that you can do is every morning you can get up and make these same declarations over your life. You can remind yourself that you're the righteousness of God. You can remind yourself who God is. Because I promise you have an enemy that is whispering nonstop lies and accusations against you, against God, against other people. And if you don't take those thoughts captive, man, you can find yourself in a pit in a New York minute. So, which is 42 seconds, by the way, in case you're wondering what a New York minute is. So, we're going to make these declarations. And again, I want to encourage you, because some of you, you, you're like me, you've been saying these for a long time. I don't, I don't want, I want to encourage you not to get on autopilot today. Would you just say it like you mean it, like you're saying it for the very first time today? Y'all ready? Let's go. God is who he says he is. God will do what he says he will do. I am who God says I am. I can do all things through Christ. God's word is truth. God's word is alive and active in me. And now because of what Christ has done, I'm highly favored, greatly blessed, and deeply loved. Do y'all believe that today? All right, let me pray over you today. Father, I, I thank you for this moment that we have. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to step into a moment Lord, where we're, we're silencing all of the world outside of us and all of the world around us, God, because we simply want to come into a moment and hear from you. Lord, we don't want to hear from Richie, God. We want to hear from you. And though, God, you may speak through me, God, I know today that you want to speak to each person, God, right where they're at, the thing that they need to hear, God, today. So, Lord, I pray whether it's been through the worship, it's through the word, it's through an encouraging word that they hear from somebody else, or God's just your still small voice being downloaded into their life. God, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts today. God, that we would take our next step, God, that we would continue to take the steps, Lord God, to follow and pursue after you. So thank you, Lord, for each person that's here, that's joining us in the house and online today. I pray blessings and favor to be upon them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. amen. You may be seated. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25, verse 31. If you don't have your Bible today, it will be on the big Bible on the screen here in just a few minutes. 
Well, last week we started this series called The One so that we can understand probably at a deeper level or at least be reminded the impact that one person can have on the lives of so many others. It, it really is amazing the impact that we can have. And in fact, if you would stop for just a moment and think, maybe your story's like Shannon's and you can remember when somebody just literally just invited you to come be a part of a baby dedication. They, they invited you to come and, and see somebody get water baptized or they just invited you to come to church because they said, man, we've got this amazing looking pastor that you just want to come listen to him for about an hour. I don't know why you always laugh every time I say that. But however you got here, however you got here, however you got here, you, was that cold and mean? Was that sarcastic? Okay. However you got here, or, or anything that someone might have said in your life or done for you in just a moment when you had kind of lost your way. Because one of the things I think even as followers of Jesus Christ is we just get lost from time to time. Not as in losing our salvation lost, but lost as in understanding the main thing. And the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And it's the focus of eternal things that matter. But think about that moment when that one person spoke life to you. They encouraged you. I was sharing in the first service that when I was young and, and I had a young man in my life that was several, about four or five years older than me, speak into my life. His name was Mike Honor. And I, I'll remember forever just that moment. I literally can, can see myself sitting down in the, in the youth room where we were on these wooden uh, pews. Y- y'all remember wooden pews in church? Man, if you could sit through a service then, that was amazing. But in this wooden pew, and I remember him putting his arm around me and speaking words of life. And I have so many of those moments with my spiritual father, him reminding me that I'm a mighty man of God when I didn't feel like a mighty man of God. My wife that encourages me all the time and just says, man, you're such a great communicator. When a lot of times I walk off the platform and don't feel like it. It's amazing the impact one person has in the lives of one another. That's why God has actually called us to reach the people that God has placed in our world. Listen to this. Even people who are different than you. Because how many of you know it's pretty easy to reach the people that are like you. The people that you think alike, look alike, you, you just got these things in common. It's, it's a lot easier to reach those people. But even people that are different than you. And so what I'd like to do today, I'd like to encourage you today and for all of us to do today is instead of looking at the world as something that is out there, something that, you know, it's really hard to kind of get your mind around, what do you mean about reaching the world or my world? I'd like us to start looking at it as something that is right here, something that is literally right in front of us every day, every moment. And what I'm talking about today is our neighbor. Uh, And not just our next door neighbor is where we live, but as our neighbor is in people that are around us. So it might be a coworker. It might be a family member. It it might be somebody that you do recreational activities together, that we begin to see the world instead of just something out there that we really can't get our mind and heart around to the the world that God has placed right in front of us. And so last week in this series, as we kind of started this, we begin to unpack what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You, You understand that Christianity is not synonymous with American. Just because you were born in a, in a nation that is a Christian nation doesn't make you a Christian. That, that we are called to be disciples. In fact, Jesus didn't say, go and make converts. He didn't say, go and make churchgoers. He said, go and make disciples. And because a disciple is a follower of Jesus. Meaning that every day I make a choice and a decision, and I don't always do it right and do it perfect, but every day I make the choice and decision to say, Jesus, I want to follow after you today. I want to do the things that you're asking me to do. God, I want to live in a way that pleases you and honors you. That's what a follower of Jesus Christ is. In fact, Jesus gave us the the, the litmus test, if you will, of how we can know if we're really followers of Jesus Christ. It's what we looked at last week in John 13. Jesus is talking, and he's saying this to his disciples, and he's saying it to every one of us today. By this... Everyone will know that you are my disciple, that you're following after me if you love one another. Because you see, our tendency is to think of a relationship with God only from, if you remember last week what I talked about, a vertical focus. 
which means the only thing that's really as important is my relationship with him or my behavior towards him. And, and when we do that, what we really want to do is we just want to make Christianity all about me and us. I, I was talking with somebody this week, and they were actually talking about somebody that they had talked to. And this person was trying to tell them, my relationship with Jesus is private. It's actually not. It's personal, but it's not private. Because you were created to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ. You were created to have an impact in the world that God's placed you in. So we've got to understand that, that it is not just private, it is personal. But God has called us to live our lives out in front of everybody. The Word of God says that we are living testimonies read of all men. So when they look at your life, what do they see? In fact, let me ask it this way today. If today you were put on trial for being a follower of Jesus Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? So Jesus has asked, because we're in this series, he's asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he said from Matthew chapter 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and he goes on to say the second is like it. So it's not second in importance, it's only second in sequence. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. So the loving God is the vertical relationship, but the other part of it is the loving others, the horizontal relationship. Again, people that look, think, di act differently than you. So again, it's not just the vertical focus that is important to God. He's actually concerned about the horizontal focus. Why is that? Because you're talking about God's children. And I don't know about you, but you talk bad about my children and don't love my children, I'm not going to be happy. No matter how much you are kind to me and, and tithe towards me or whatever it means that we do towards God, if you don't love my children, we're going to have some problems. So God wants us to love his children. And, and it's important to understand, even in the Old Covenant, that Jesus didn't come to abolish the Old Covenant and the law. He actually came to fulfill it. That's why he showed us that there were two greatest commandments. His teaching were giving people a heads up. Listen, things are changing. This is new. That, that we're heading in a different direction from where we used to be. It was going to be their love for others that would actually be the true test of their love for God. Listen, and, and I'm not saying this today, so please hear me, that if you don't love others perfectly, you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. Listen, none of us do. And, and when we don't, we should actually probably apologize. Preach it, Pastor Richie. You, you say something that's a little bit ugly because they said something ugly to you, and the Holy Spirit begins to say, hey, Richie, you know what? That's actually not who you are. In fact, it's actually not even who they are. Because what I've learned in being in ministry as long as I have is that hurting people hurt people. Meaning if somebody gets damaged long enough, all they know how to do is damage other people. So what if we begin to repent? But listen, it does concern me. When I see people that are in churches, and Christian or not Christian, I'm not totally sure, but I see absolutely no evidence of them loving others. I, I, don't, I don't see them being concerned about people by caring for them, serving them, loving them, reaching out to them, extending, to even turning the other cheek. Yeah. It concerns me. And listen, I'm not here to be a judge. Man, the last thing I would want to ever do that because in the measure that I, we judge others is the measure that we actually get judged. So I'm not here to judge, but I do want all of us to be aware of what Jesus thinks about this. The way that Jesus looks at it. In fact, in Matthew chapter 25, it's talking about the end of the age, meaning when this life is over and we're now sitting before the throne of God. Here's what it says in Matthew 25, verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man comes in all his glory and the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. It goes on to talk about how he's going to divide the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous. And then he's going to say to those that are righteous, those who are in right standing with God, he said, he'll say to them, come, you who are blessed of my Father, come and enjoy the inheritance that has been prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Listen, I love my life now. I, I love that I get to be blessed now and all the amazing things that happen now. But compared to heaven, yeah. whoo, this, this place doesn't hold a candle to it. 
listen, so check it out and take note of the, the actions of the righteous, how they prove that they actually were righteous. It says this in verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. When, when the king is going to say that to the righteous, it actually takes them by surprise. And, and they said, wait, wait, wait. When did we actually do that to you? Going on in verse 40, it says, the king will reply, tell you, I tell, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Listen, it was their love for others expressed through actions of giving of serving, of being kind when people are unkind, of being loving when people are unloving. Is that easy? Not all the time. But they still made the choice. That's how they express love for God. And and if you'll read the rest of the story, you'll discover that the unrighteous were cast out. Why? Because they didn't express love that way. When, When people were hungry, they just said, sorry, don't have time for you. When people were mean to them, they were mean back. Come on, let me put it in today's vernacular. People posted ugly things about them. They posted ugly things about them. Listen, my point is to make you aware that Jesus really is very, very serious about loving our neighbor thing. He wants you and I to love our neighbor. And not sometimes through the filter of the way that we understand love as the tough love. He wants us to love others the way Christ has loved us. So his point in this great commandment formula is that when you obey the two commands, you have fully obeyed all of the other commands that you find in the Old Covenant. So the question that we need to ask and answer and understand when we leave today is, who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? And and as I said last week, when Jesus was the first one to put together this greatest commandment formula, the the loving God section is found in the book of Deuteronomy, and the loving others is found in the book of Leviticus. But if you go to Leviticus chapter 19, and, and you'll read this, what you'll begin to discover is that for Jewish people, one's neighbor was other Jewish people. Meaning, their love for their neighbor, loving their neighbor as their self, was for them to love people who were just like them other Jewish people. But Jesus recognized that he needed to broaden the term neighbor if his new movement was going to have the global impact that he actually knew it needed to have. So what he had done, so Jesus did as he had done on other occasions, he altered the rules, he he redefined terms, and, and here's how it happened. Shortly after episode one of Stump the Rabbi, you remember that I talked about that last week? Jesus was approached by another lawyer. Now, I said this in last service, and I want to say it again, but sometimes when you have a lawyer lawyer approaching you, how many of you know that's typically not a really good thing? Now, I've got some lawyers as my my good friends, and I think a lot of lawyers are really good, but typically it's not a really good thing. So this lawyer comes to him with another trick question. And here's how Luke writes it in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's a great question, by the way. But Jesus knew that there was a question behind the question, so Jesus asked the lawyer a question himself. When he said this, what is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? Now, it's interesting because... This lawyer recited the same verse that Jesus and he had been taught at a very early age. But this guy's pretty smart. He'd actually been paying attention, so he knew all about Jesus' greatest commandment formula. So here's how he responds. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus goes on, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But then the lawyer actually really shows his true cards, what his motive was really behind asking the question, because it says in the next verse, but he wanted to justify himself. Have you ever had somebody that they're really asking you something, but they really are just trying to justify themselves? He wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? So 
what he was really asking Jesus was, if loving others is proof of my love for God, what's the minimum amount of love required to ensure eternal life? Who exactly do I need to love to ensure me some of that eternal life you've been talking about? See, he was looking, as I talked about last week, he was looking to see how close to the not okay line he could get and still be okay. Right? So he's looking for a vertical, again, salvation relationship and formula that it's just about you and I. Listen, it's not for God's sake he's asking this. It's not for his neighbor's sake. It's for his sake. So he asked the question, so who is my neighbor? Then Jesus shares a story that I think is so brilliant because we have reduced it honestly to a figure of speech. But he actually redefines neighbor for everyone. Here's what he says. In, in reply, Jesus said, a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, I'm sure the lawyer's thinking, now, wait, you're not talking about my neighbor because that's not the neighborhood I live in, yeah. right? Yeah. You know the story. Two religious leaders pass by their beaten, bleeding, dying Jewish brother. Yeah. Somebody that was just like them. And they don't lift one finger to help. You know what they probably did is, boy, I sure hope somebody helps them out. I'll even pray for you. I'll pray for you. Somebody needs to help them out. Listen, if Jesus' greatest commandment formula is right, these religious leaders, they are not loving God. They are not walking in the eternal life that God actually has for them. Going on in verse 33, and Jesus goes on and says, but a Samaritan... Now, Jesus probably had to pause to let the murmur from the crowd die down a little bit. Because to Jesus' audience, they probably assumed that the Samaritan was the one that caused the problems in the first place. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. To which, again, his audience must have thought, surely Jesus isn't going to make the Samaritan the hero in the story, is he? He was. And we went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey. You realize he's now going to have to walk. You understand how out of the way the love is he's showing to this man. He puts the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn to take care of him. Now, Jesus audience, to Jesus' audience, this has to be crazy. No Samaritan they had ever met would ever show that kind of concern for any Jew. Listen. These groups didn't talk to one another. These groups didn't like each other, let alone touch them. Think problems in the Middle East where people are blowing one another up. Let me make it really practical for you today. Think about someone who doesn't look, think, talk, act, or believe like you do. Someone that you totally do not understand. Every time they say something, you roll your eyes. Think about someone that when they say something or do something or act a certain way, it makes you angry. And even if it doesn't make you angry, something begins to stand up on the inside of you and you're like, okay, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. That's exactly who I'm talking about. Listen, listen, think, think about somebody who has different religious beliefs than you. Or here's the hot one for today. Think about somebody that has a different political belief than you. The man, I just wish President Trump was still here. Man, thank God for President Biden. Which, whichever one you would hear and it makes your blood boil, that's who we're talking about. Somebody who has a different ethnic upbringing, or ethnic, has a different ethnicity, excuse me, than you. Somebody that was raised differently than you. Somebody that's at a different financial place in their life than you. And, and, they, and they bother you. Again, that's who Jesus is talking about. And in this story, he goes on to say, the next day to which Jesus' audience had to be saying, are you kidding me? The next day? The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Listen, for the Jewish people that are hearing this story, and it's hard again for us to put ourselves in there, this is so over the top. It is. Listen, they shouldn't have to spend this much of their imagination on a story designed by Jesus to distract them from the original question. 
But once they settled down, Jesus did something that they wouldn't live long enough to really appreciate. He redefined neighbor for everyone forever. He broadened the definition of neighbor to include people who don't think, look, act, or believe like you. That's our neighbor. Listen, again, the significance of this parable is often missed because, again, we've reduced it to a figure of speech. The Good Samaritan, boy, there's a Good Samaritan, and we don't really understand it. But this changed forever. Jesus changed forever how we are to define our neighbor. That it's no longer the people that look like us, think like us, act like us. It's people that are different than us. And this is new. And again, this is challenging. Because I know as I'm saying this, some of you got your heels digged in going, oh, no, Pastor Richie, not me. I'm, I'm, I, you just don't understand these, these people. They, they don't really love God. They don't, they don't really know Jesus. If they did, they wouldn't vote Republican. Or they wouldn't vote Democrat. Just heads up, Jesus is neither a Republican or a Democrat, just so you know. All right? He loves all people, and he sees all people as their neighbor. This challenges us. It challenges us to actually walk out of faith that's not driven by our feelings and our emotions. It challenges us to make right decisions in moments because you can today decide, okay, all right, Pastor Richie, I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. If I feel like it, I'm going to try it. It it isn't going to work that way. You simply have to make the decision. I'm going to allow the love of God that's in me. It's one of the reasons why I spend so much time talking about the love of God. Because we've got to believe it, we've got to receive it, we've got to understand how perfectly God loves us. The Word of God says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world, the saved world, the lost world, that he sent his only son to die on an old rugged cross to pay the penalty for our sin. That's the kind of love that we need in us. We don't have to have, it's not just about our love. We have to have the love of God. We have to have the love of God in us. This challenges us. And the reason why it challenges us is because everyone knows the answer to Jesus' last question. Jesus asked the lawyer, and he said, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The answer is obvious. The implications of the answer, not so much. Because there was actually a question behind Jesus' question. See, Jesus' question was, Who had loved the Lord his God, with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind. Who had actually laid claim to eternal life? I believe that when Jesus asked that question, I believe that the lawyer paused before answering the question. You want to know why? Because the moment the the lawyer answered that question, he knew that he would be accountable to his answer to the question. And so the expert in the law replied in verse 37, the one who had mercy on him. Listen, apparently the lawyer couldn't even utter the ethnic identity of the hero in the story. But it was the Samaritan, the the one that was despised. He was the one that showed mercy. He was the one that actually laid claim to eternal life. He was the one that through his actions expressed love for God. And so in the next verse, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And just so you know, that's what Jesus says to every one of us today. To go and do likewise. Go show love to people that are unlovable. Go and be kind to people that are unkind. Go go and show mercy to people who don't understand mercy because they're not showing mercy to you. And as I said earlier, this was new. This literally, people are having to rethink the way that they thought. But Jesus had redefined neighbor for everyone forever. He had decided, this isn't, we can't live the way that we used to live. We've got to redefine what a neighbor actually is. See, neighbor would no longer be defined those that were near to us. But our neighbor would be everyone and anyone. Everyone that we come in contact with and anyone that God places in our life. See, it was actually our neighbor love, the, the, the ability to choose to love our neighbor that was evidence of God love for others. Listen, this would be the proof that we're followers of Jesus Christ. This would be the proof of our love for God. 
So again, it, it's, it's hard for us to place ourselves in this moment of what is actually taking place. But Jesus was moving from an old covenant mindset where love for God was expressed through our obedience. Is it still important to be obedient? Yes. But, but not as something that qualifies us. Not as something that, that makes us right with Jesus. We've been made right with Jesus. Being obedient is simply a response to understanding that we've been made right with Jesus. He was, he was moving us from this mindset of adhering to the laws the, to this new covenant mindset where love for others that we could see was the litmus test of our love for God that we couldn't see. I say that again. Jesus was moving us again to this new covenant mindset where love for others that we actually could see was the litmus test of our love for a God that we couldn't see. See, it is our love for people. Again, many who don't act, think, believe, respond like us. That really is the proof that we are followers of Jesus Christ. That we made a decision once again today. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. So I choose to grow in this. I choose to mature in this. I, I choose to not let my personal feelings, my, my, my political beliefs, my, my religious beliefs, whatever they may be that contradict the love of God, I choose to not allow those things to be determining, to determine my behavior or my actions. That every day I make that one more step. God, I want to be just like you. God, I want to be just like you. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of the world being like it is, and I'm going to appoint myself as a committee of one to be a change agent in the world that God has placed me in. Again, that's why Jesus said, by this, by the love that we have for others, everyone will know that you're my disciples. Everyone will know I'm daily dying to myself, following after you, by the love that we have for one another. So let, let me close with a question, actually two questions as I close today. Should we express our love for God in the moments when we just feel like loving God? Or should we express our love for God by obeying Him? Or should we express our love for God by putting those that are around us ahead of us? By giving to them, caring for them, serving them, being there for them, going the extra mile for them. Again, I want you to understand, God's not asking you and I to wrap our arms around seven and a half, eight billion people that are in our world. But he is asking us to wrap our arms around the people that are in our world that's right in front of us. The people that God's placed in our life, whether they think like us, look like us, or act like us, it doesn't matter. We get the opportunity all the time to be the love and hope of Jesus Christ. Listen, it is the horizontal loving others that really expresses the vertical love to God. So what would you be willing to do to change your world? Last question, what, what would you be willing to do to change our world? Because people tell me all the time, man, Pastor Rich, I'd do whatever. This is it. This is literally it. I say, Pastor Rich, how can you say that? You, you don't know if this works. I do know that it works. Because the early church, which was about 120 people that were baptized on the day of Pentecost, literally turned the world upside down by loving their neighbor as themselves. They, they didn't have a bunch of rules and regulations. They didn't know really what this new movement was fully going to look like. But they simply made a decision. I've received the love of God. I've received the love of God. I'm going to go out and figure out every day how I can give the love of God away. I mean, honestly, if you just think about that in a very practical way, you know that it would change your family. It would change your neighborhood. It would change your workplace if you simply made the choice to do it. And again... It's not about perfection, but it's about readjusting all the time. God, I'm going to be a follower of you. So I want to pray over us today. And there's two things that I want to pray today. I want to pray, first of all, that you receive the love of God and that you make a choice to give that love away. That when you get out into the world and you're eating lunch today and the waitress isn't doing a great job or the waiter isn't doing a great job, that instead of, you know, belly aching, griping, and complaining, you just simply make a choice to be the love of Jesus to a person that's probably having a rough day. When you get to work tomorrow and the person that drives you nuts comes up and starts dialoguing about that political thing that you disagree with or the fact that they're not a cowboy fan, we'll be praying for them. Whatever it might be, 
You just simply make a choice to say, God, I've received your love. I'm going to give the love of God away. I'm going to do the very best of my ability where I'm at today because I'm going to take a baby step just to become more like Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And would you take just a moment to open up your heart to God? And just, just ask God right now. Say, God, is, is there any part of the message that Richie's speaking to me right now that I need to make some adjustments in? Is, is there any part of what I'm doing that, that I need to do something differently? God, I pray that you'd help me see it. God, that you'd help me to understand that my loving has been very conditional because it's based on the love that I received as a child. Whatever it might be, just say, God, is there anything in me that I need to change? So, Lord, I pray right now over us, God, first of all, that you'd reveal behaviors, actions, things that we say, things that we do, God, that contradict, God, your nature. And, Lord, we no longer excuse it saying, well, God, everyone else is doing it. Or, God, this person just drives me so nuts I can't help it. That we would simply make a choice to receive the love of God, to be overwhelmed with the love of God, to be consumed with the love of God. That every place we go and everywhere we're at, we're giving the love of God away. That we're allowing other people to see Jesus in us. That their life has changed. And God, I pray for a dying to the flesh, the dying to the wrong habits and wrong behaviors that we've had in the past. And that today we would all make a choice. This, this thing that challenges us, God, to love our neighbor as ourself. So God, help us. Help us to receive the love of God and help us give that love away every day, every moment. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.